Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining today's webinar with the Council on Foundations, getting started with values aligned philanthropy for community foundations. As we begin, here are a few call reminders. If you have any questions, please submit them using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can also email webinars at cof.org if you have any questions or any technical difficulties during the call. This webinar is being recorded. The recording will be shared with all participants and posted on our website later this week. For closed captioning, please click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and select show subtitles or view full transcript. I will now hand it over to Nadal Zuyer, Manager of Government Relations at the Council on Foundations. Thank you, Caroline, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, as Caroline said, my name is Nidal here, and I'm the Government Affairs Manager here at the Council. I'm joined by a fantastic panel today. Um, Rowie Thorpe, the independent consultant who's been working with the Council on this project pretty much since its inception, and who authored our two Values Aligned publications, will be leading us through this toolkit. We also have a great panel of community foundation peers, Mei Leong, the Chief Institutional Partnerships Officer at the East Bay Community Foundation, Sarah Shannon, Chief Operating Officer at the Brooklyn Community Foundation, and Jason Wiener, Philanthropic Advisor at the Cleveland Foundation. Thank you to all four of you for being here today. I'm sure that this is going to be an enlightening and interesting conversation. Um, so I'm just going to give a little bit of background. Uh, the Council has been doing this values aligned philanthropy work for the last couple of years. This was in response to a rise in hate crimes and extremist activities that we were seeing. And simultaneously, we were hearing from foundations and in particular community foundations that they wanted guidance and support on developing policies to ensure that they weren't funding hate groups, especially when those groups have 501c3 status. So the status itself stops being an effective screening tool. Um, so we started working to understand the issue with the goal of helping foundations get ahead of hate funding by encouraging them to establish values aligned grant making policies. Last year, we published a white paper that was a landscape scan on what the field is already doing, and you can see that on the left side of your screen, plus an accompanying resource hub that we continue to update. We got largely positive feedback, but we also heard that this topic is really complex and that the process itself isn't always obvious and could use some extra demystification. Um, community foundations wanted additional guidance on the actual how to step by step of establishing these policies. And that's the conversation that led us to work with Rowe to develop this toolkit. So for the next 45 minutes or so, Rowe will walk us through using the toolkit and you'll hear from some of your community foundation peers on how they develop their own policies. We will have time at the end for questions, so please submit any to the Q&A function on Zoom. And Rowe, you have the floor. Great, thank you so much, Nidal. Um, I appreciate that. Um, it's so great to see so many people here, and it reflects the high degree of interest we've heard throughout this project. Um, I'm guessing that um, the large number of people who are with us also reflect um, the cultural and political climate of the moment. It seems like every day brings new reports of incidents of hate and anti-government extremism here in the US and globally. And this is reflected in FBI statistics on rising rates of hate violence over the past several years. Um, I, as I'm sure you know, the philanthropic sector has been publicly criticized for funding hate groups. And the sector has responded in many ways to help the flow of, to stop the flow of funds to these organizations. Um, an overview of philanthropy's response is detailed in the white paper that Nidal mentioned and that you see on the screen here. Um, but one of the most direct and powerful actions has been for foundations to explicitly forbid the funding of hate in their organizational policies and to make donors, including donors to donor advised funds, grantees, vendors, and all stakeholders aware of the stand. Many foundations have taken the steps um, and the Council on Foundations encourages all organizations in the sector to do so. 
In the interviews that informed the Values Aligned Philanthropy White Paper, we heard from foundations that had created these policies that a big hurdle was having to figure out where to start and not having the guidance and information that would have helped. Those accounts led directly to this toolkit, as Nadal said, and to the council's work to bring philanthropic organizations into conversation to support each other in taking action. As you'll see, the toolkit has lots of useful parts that will help you in each phase of the process. There are links to sample policies that you can use as a starting point, answers to key questions that might arise in the process, and links to some high, highly recommended resources uh, that we've pulled together with many others available on the Council's resource hub. In the toolkit specifically, you'll see that we've broken down the process of developing a policy into five sections, each focusing on uh, one step in the process. First, lay the groundwork for your policy. Second, define your values. Third, create and adopt your policy. Fourth, communicate your policy. And fifth, implement your policy. We've done our best to clearly define these steps while being intentional about not providing a cookie cutter approach. We recognize that each foundation will have different needs depending on your existing policies, values, and your stakeholders. Our hope is that this gives you the tools you need to develop policies that work for your foundation with the shared goal of that we all have of preventing funding of hate and extremism. So instead of doing a separate slide presentation, we're going to encourage you to actually take this opportunity to dive into the toolkit itself. Um, so please use the link posted in the chat to follow along as we go through the sections of the toolkit. With me providing a brief overview of each section, we'll tell you what page number we're on. Um, and then our guests will be giving examples of their foundation's experience with that step of the process. So let's dive in. The first step is laying the groundwork for your policy, which you'll find on page four of the toolkit. As you begin, it's important to make sure that you create a shared understanding within your foundation on the issues involved and why it's important for your foundation to take action. One of the big fears that many foundations have is suddenly being faced with a media report, waking up to the news that they have been funding a hate group and having to scramble to deal with the impact on their reputation and relationships. The time to deal with this issue is before such an incident occurs because having a policy and procedure in place will both minimize the chances that you'll fund a hate group in the first place and also prepare you for a swift response if a concern arises. This section contains links to the council's position statement, uh, which people had asked for and which you might wanna share with your board and um, some answers to key questions that might arise as you consider whether, whether and how to take action on this issue. As part of this step, we recommend that you take a look at past funding to determine whether you have funded organizations that could be problematic under a new policy so that you can get a feel for the impact that this might have on future grant decisions. No foundation that I'm aware of has had more than a couple of problem uh, organizations surface and many report none at all. Now, this, if this is you, it doesn't mean that you don't need a policy, but it does mean that you're nipping a potential problem in the bud. So yay. Um, I'll talk a bit about the resources we link to, but um, first I want to introduce you to Mei Liang, who can talk about this first phase of policy development. Mei is the Chief Institutional Partnerships Officer for the East Bay Community Foundation in California. She's going to share what caused East Bay Community Foundation to decide to create an anti-hate policy in the first place and the steps they took to make sure the board and staff understood the reasons for it. So May, I'll turn it over to you. 
Great. Thank you so much for having me, Roe. I'm really happy to be here. Um, so first, I'll just uh, spend like a few seconds talking about the East Bay Community Foundation because we were founded in 1928. So we've been here for over 90 years um, in the community, working with um, our community partners. And so over the past few years, we've been moving to uh, working on moving from the old transactional model where we just would open up a fund and then we would make whatever grants the fund holder um, asked us to, to more being... Um, a place where people can have transformational experiences, both for fund holders and our partners and our grantees. So that meant working with everyone in a more thoughtful way, um, especially through fund holder grant making. And so we look to make everything we do really align closely with our values and mission. And I know you're gonna be talking about that later, especially um, our value mission to address systemic barriers to racial equity and racial justice. So having said that, um, about, I would say, 98% of our grant recommendations are processed without a problem. So that leaves you the small fraction of about 2% for the gray zone for vetting. And so the experience that we had was we, a few years ago, had a problematic grant recommendation come up that was flagged actually by one of our staff members. Um, and so it it was something where the grant was going to go to an organization that was funding uh, an organization or supporting an organization that had problematic work that was that they did basically um, against international human rights. And so at the time that the grant recommendation was made, EBCF had no policy in place to discern which grants we would or would not make. Um, you know, as a community foundation, we do have a responsibility to honor donor intent. Um, and at the same time, it also is not the best practice to have the decision made by one or two people in the organization. And so we realized we needed a process for vetting all grant recommendations equally. And so um, at that time, because we did not have a policy in place, we had to allow the problematic grant to be made. And this is what spurred us to develop a process and a policy. And so the staff formed a committee and did research. And the committee also drafted a policy in, for vetting flagged grant recommendations. And in the work that we did, this, this took quite a bit of time, at least over a year. And we decided we wanted to use a donor education approach, supplement it with options when talking with fund holders about problematic grant recommendations, because sometimes they really weren't aware. And so the other thing too that we did that was super helpful, I wanna give a shout out to the Greater um, uh, Memphis Community Foundation because we looked to them uh, at their policy that they had at the time um, as, a, as a great model and example of what we could then draft and customize for our needs. And so we also worked with the Human Rights Center at the University of California, Berkeley. We, we entered into an MOU with them and there was a lead attorney who was also a professor at the law school who supervised a group of law students in research and recommendations to EBCF with the focus on an international human rights framework for our grants due diligence policy. Um, and so we worked on the policy, which was reviewed and approved by the CEO and also shared with the board. And really it also extremely important was we had legal counsel review the policy. So that was our experience in terms of how we went about working on this. Thank you so much, May. That, that level of detail is just fascinating and I think really helpful for people to hear. So thank you. Um, I want to highlight for everyone the resources that you'll find on page six in the toolkit, um, which are tools to help you determine whether uh, or not you have past or current grantees who might be considered hate groups. We know that it would be a lot easier if there was one definitive list um, that uh, we could consult that would have all the answers. Uh, but while some organizations are unabashed in their hateful activity, often that's not the case. Um, these issues can be complex and different foundations can come to different conclusions about an organization. This section has links to several lists and tools that we think you'll find helpful. Uh, most organizations start with the Southern Poverty Law Centers list. Um, they have 
two lists. One is of hate groups um, and one is of anti-government extremist groups. Um, these are very helpful, but you might wanna learn more information um, or get a different perspective. So we include lists, links to lists from the Anti-Defamation League and the Council on American Islamic Relations. And we also include a link to the Horizon Forum, which is creating a tool that compiles a number of different lists along with other resources that can help you evaluate individual groups. So, once you have a better understanding of the issues and you've laid the groundwork, it's time to clarify your foundation's values with regard to hate and extremism. You'll find this uh, step on page seven of the toolkit. Um, this step is one that could be very clear and quick for foundations that have had discussions on diversity and inclusion issues um, and require a little more from those who haven't done that work in the past. Um, the toolkit has a template you can fill in to create a value statement for your organization with samples of value statements that other foundations have used that can help get you started. Your value statement should also include the definition of hate and extremism that you'll be using. One thing I want to highlight here is that sometimes board or staff members can have concerns that creating this kind of policy um, or coming up with these definitions is making a political statement that'll be divisive or controversial within the organization and just bring in a whole raft of trouble that you don't want. I just wanna reassure you that with the foundations that I've spoken with, which is many foundations at this point, um, this has not been the case. And that actually the key is sticking to your values, which is why we don't just give you a cookie cutter approach. Um, the toolkit gives examples from found community foundations from very different parts of the country who've taken a stand against hate in ways that are true to their organization and the communities that they serve. The common ground that we've seen in uh, definitions is that hate groups target groups and individuals based on their characteristics. Some policies differentiate between beliefs and actions, while others focus on the threat itself, both implicit and explicit, uh, that people in targeted groups experience. And you will need to figure out what uh, works best for you and what's truest to your organization's values. Um, at this point, to give an example of this, I want to introduce Sarah Shannon who is the Chief Operating Officer for the Brooklyn Community Foundation in New York. Um, Sarah is going to describe for us the values that the Brooklyn Community Foundation um, has based their policies on and the process that they used for defining those values. So Sarah, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Rowie. Um, interesting. Unlike uh, my fellow panelists, we are quite a young community foundation here in Brooklyn. Um, we were founded in 2009 with the assets of a private bank foundation, um, about 75 million or so. Um, we're now about 150 million, 115 million in assets, and we do about 13 million in annual grant making, about 8 million of that being donor directed. Um, and we do have an explicit commitment to centering racial justice and working toward long-term change, which dates back to a Brooklyn Insights process that we launched um, and a community engagement process, which built a strategy and focus for our work around the concerns and ideas from our, our, our residents and our communities. So 2014 was a very big year for us. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the foundation was founded in 2009, but we've been struggling to show our value to the community um, in being a more transactional sort of community foundation. So we decided to lead with our values as they were surfaced through the Brooklyn Insights process. Um, and, you know, uh, so 2014 was kind of like a, a reboot for us and that's and 2.0. And through the Brooklyn Insights process, we identified that racial justice was the defining issue in our community. Brooklyn is about 70% uh, people of color. 
So since 2014, we've been on a journey to do philanthropy differently, um, including shifting our strategic grant making entirely to participatory models. We provide general operating support. Um, we reduce application and reporting burdens for nonprofits, um, giving equal grant amounts, um, and ensuring that a majority of our strategic grants go to BIPOC-led organizations. So as I mentioned, you know, we have our own, we started with our own underlying endowment. So um, we have quite a bit, you know, last year we did about 5 million in our own strategic grant making. So we have, we have both of these, um, both of these sort of sides of the house, if you will, going concurrently. So um, we have also uh, really been earnestly more developing our DAF program um, since 2014. We've grown our assets from about 2 million to now they represent about 45% of our total assets at 55 million. And you know, this program has grown organically, mostly through referrals, word of mouth, and people seeking out you know, Brooklyn-based solutions. So, but we found that by leading with our values, we're attracting like-minded DAF holders who share our vision and commitment to a, a better Brooklyn through our racial justice uh, grant making. And I know there's been, you know, some mention of, um, of uh, you know, how is this going to um, be received by internal and external stakeholders. And, and I can say that we have, you know, we definitely um, lost a few donors and a few board members along the way. Um, but we definitely feel like, um, you know, our unique uh, value proposition is exactly what our community needs and that our DAF is you know, the perfect uh, vehicle for you know, investing in this solution. So you know, our, our, our sort of commitments are, our taglines are, you, know, you live in Brooklyn, so should your DAF. Um, you have the freedom to give everywhere, anywhere, but 1% of your fee goes to racial justice grant making. So, right? so because we started with that, in like that little nest egg, that covers our operational costs. So our, our DAF fees go back out to our community through our uh, strategic grant investments. Um, and uh, in 2019, um, we started, we signed on to an anti-hate policy uh, developed um, in response to the Hate is Not Charitable campaign of the Amalgamated Foundation. So we signed on to that and included an anti-hate policy, um, which we have very you know, upfront on our website. Um, and we are largely consulting the Southern Poverty Law Center um, hate map, as you mentioned, Rowie. Um, sometimes we're, we're doing other things. We have not surfaced uh, a grant yet that has, you know, that has caused concern, which is, <laughs> which is a relief. Um, but um, we know a lot of the giving through our DAF program is driven through peer-to-peer -peer solicitation. So, um, you know, we want to ensure that every grant is properly viewed and, you know, doesn't violate our policy. Um, you know, it re also reduces the burden on the DAF holders to do the research themselves. Um, and, you know, I would say that, um, that this has this feels very consistent to our DAF holders in terms of our overall values and and you know as I said we've led with those very much um, on all of our fund pages on the website um, and um, we also provide resources for DAF holders who want to do racial justice grant making in the community um, but we've found with our program. Um, that you know that continues to to grow a sort of leaps and bounds. That having that value statement front and center really resonates with our our donors and differentiates us from other DAF programs, whether they're the big commercial providers or um, we have a few other community foundations in our in our area. Um, one of the oldest and largest, as some may know, but. Um, but yeah, we just uh, have found that this is really um, the right, you know, the right approach for us and for our community a a as a whole. Um, so. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. And um, just so the members of our audience know, we'll have an opportunity for Q&A um, at the end. So um, 
so if people have questions yes. specifically about what any of our presenters um, are sharing, you'll have a chance to ask questions. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Um, the the toolkit has links to resources to help you with this stage. Um, for those who need to do more work to develop your values, we strongly recommend Peak Grant Making's Guide to help organizations define their values. They have a really great set of tools to help with that, um, that can walk you through that. Also on page nine in the toolkit, you'll find examples of the language that foundations from across the political spectrum have used to define hate. And you can draw from those and sort of use those as examples depending on what your foundation's needs are. So on to the next section. Now that you have defined your organizational values, you are ready for step three, which is creating and adopting your policy. Finally, um, this section starts on page 10 of the toolkit. Um, the council has identified four main types of policy structures that community foundations are using um, for these policies. With some policies, you'll see in the examples that are hybrids of two or more types, but there are four main types. So the first is a due diligence policy that includes screening for hate groups as part of your due diligence. Um, second is requiring a non-discrimination policy for all grantees that includes groups that are most likely to be targeted by hate. Third is embedding an anti-hate policy into a broader DEI policy. And fourth is creating a freestanding policy that's aligned with your organizational values but isn't embedded in another uh, section of policy work. The toolkit provides links to a few examples for each of these types. Um, the section also discusses policy scope and recommends uh, including as wide a scope as possible. For example, not just direct grants, but also donor advised fund requests, um, vendor contracts, and donations and sponsorship that sponsorships that your foundation accepts, because those can sometimes be areas of concern. Um, this section recommends coming up with an implementation plan as well for how to handle concerns when they arise um, and takes a deeper dive into some key questions that you can ask that are specifically related to donor advised funds, um, both why it's important to have a policy that includes DAFs and your foundation's rights when it comes to where funds are directed. So now um, I wanna move to Jason Weiner. Jason is here to tell us about what his foundation did. Jason uh, is a philanthropic advisor for the Cleveland Foundation in Ohio. Uh, Jason, if you could describe for us the type of policy that you created um, and what it covers, and also, Tell us how it went when the board adopted it and whether there were any issues that arose when, when the board did that. Thank you, Roe. Um, happy to do that. It's a real privilege to be a part of this um, panel. I just wanna certainly say that and to be side by side with my colleagues from uh, Brooklyn and uh, the Bay Area. So thank you for that and the chance to talk about this uh, today. So what I'll... Um, Say I, I, you know, I like the just taking a second to situate um, uh, a little bit of the work that Cleveland Foundation is doing, and uh, what I'll start by saying is that we're working um, with um, uh, approximately 630 donor advised uh, funds uh, every year, and, and uh, we also have an additional uh, about 330 organizational fund partnerships with nonprofits in the communities, and then a variety of other. Uh, funds that are established um, where there aren't donors who are living who are making recommendations, but uh, it's a, a large uh, group of donor advised funds that we have the, the privilege um, to work with. And if we're looking at distributing approximately uh, $100 million a year, about half of that is coming from our uh, program side, our responsive grant making uh, team. Uh, and about half of that is coming from our uh, our donors, and they're making gifts just like a 
everyone uh, on the call here to organizations across the country. A lot of them are supporting Cleveland-based organizations, uh, but certainly many are free to uh, support organizations anywhere uh, in, in the United States. So, and currently I serve as a, a, a member of our uh, anti-hate group policy task force, which really was set up to implement our policy, uh, which was adopted in uh, 2020 by our board of directors. So a, a uh, um, cross-departmental committee came together. We had representation from our marketing and communications team working with our advancement team and our program team and legal counsel and our grants management uh, team uh, worked together to review a lot of the research that's already been done. Uh, somebody mentioned, uh, Sarah mentioned the Hate is Not a Charitable campaign. Um, the chance to talk with May at, at East Bay Community Foundation, uh, really to just get a sense of work that's already been done, work that's underway, uh, and just to get a sense of what uh, an anti-hate group policy would look like in Cleveland at the Cleveland Foundation. And what we wound up uh, wound up doing is adopting what I would say is you know sort of part of a, a partial due diligence uh, policy and a partial freestanding uh, freestanding policy. So the Cleveland Foundation itself is certainly committed um, to racial equity, racial justice, social justice, uh, and addressing uh, the consequences of structural racism in Cleveland. And we do a lot of that work through our responsive uh, and proactive grant making programs. Uh, and so the work of aligning donors there um, and you know, identifying donors who are interested in that work and getting them connected uh, to uh, a lot of our, that, those strategic priorities for the foundation um, you know, has been ongoing at the foundation for, uh, for several years. So uh, part of uh, the bigger picture thinking of that included uh, thinking about creating a, uh, an anti-hate group policy. Uh, so that committee that I referred to earlier did come together, did do their due diligence, did do their research and, and drafted a policy that was um, unanimously adopted by our board of directors in September of uh, 2020. Uh, and, you know, it, it's, um, I just have it here and thought maybe I could just kind of go through it quickly so that we recognize the social, racial, and economic injustices that persist in our community and in the world, and we appreciate our role as servant leaders to address the root causes of these systemic issues. The Cleveland Foundation relies on the IRS to regulate organizations, but we, if we have knowledge of a public charity that is engaged in hateful activities, defined to mean activities that incite or engage in violence, intimidation, harassment, threats, or defamation targeting an individual or group based upon their actual or perceived race, color, religion, national origin, ethnicity, immigration status, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, or disability, we will not permit grants to that charity. So this is the policy that uh, we uh, apply to our uh, donor advised fund uh, uh, grant making that happens, the, the, the programmatic grant making um, utilizes it a well less formally, but certainly uh, is, is not supporting organizations that fall into those categories. Uh, and we do, like many of the people have already on this call have already said, we rely heavily on Southern Poverty Law Center's list of known hate groups and the Anti-Defamation League as well. Um, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm really happy to say that the board unanimously approved the policy and enthusiastically stands behind uh, our policy, and there are no issues uh, to report on around the policy, uh, the process of um, of adopting and implementing the policy. That's terrific. Thank you. Thank you for for all of that detail and um, and sharing that process with us. Um, so uh, to go back to the toolkit for a second, um, the toolkit provides links to sample policies um, that you can check out, um, questions to ask yourself about implementation. And also on page 12, um, you'll see a document that is shared by the St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation that they provided to their board, um, giving an overview of their policy prior to the board voting on it. Um, if it's helpful, you can use this as a template and um, uh, adapt it for your own foundation um, 
so that you can see what they what they ended up showing their board right before they voted. Um, so uh, once you have created and adopted your policy, the time has come to let people know about it. Section four is communicating your policy, um, starting on page 14. This is an area that can make people nervous um, because letting stakeholders and the public know uh, can trigger fears of creating controversy and division, as I spoke of earlier. Um, and in reality, foundations we spoke with reported far less of that kind of reaction and far more appreciative community response. Um, I think, especially in the times that we're living in, people are really grateful that someone's taking action. And um, making your policy public and transparent to all stakeholders also reduces the chance of future problems, and it helps you implement the policy in case concerns do arise. So this is particularly important when it comes to notifying donors to DAFs about changes to your policy. So you'll want to identify stakeholder groups that you want to inform and create a plan that includes when and how you'll notify them. You can craft the communications for each stakeholder group accordingly. Um, and now for this next section, we're going to go back to Mei Liang from East Bay Community Foundation to talk to us about uh, their experience. Mei, could you describe how East Bay communicated your policy uh, with your stakeholders and the response that you got when you did that? Sure, I'd be happy to. So at the same time when we launched our um, due diligence policy, we also it launched an inactive fund policy. And the idea was that the two policies work hand in hand as a way to help us further support our goal of getting more money out into out, out the door to mission aligned organizations. We also created an FAQ to help answer questions that we anticipated people would have. And so the policies were all they were communicated out through multi channels. So, for example, we we physically mailed uh, the new policies to all the fund holders. We also posted it on our website. And then we also included a link to the policies and all welcome packets for new funds. And the policies were also included in a resource page on our grant making online portal. And so um, also we worked with the development and donor services staff with talking points in case fund holders had questions. So we launched that in November of 2019. It's been almost three years now. And I would say about kind of looking back, um, we had roughly in the very beginning anyway, the last two years, uh, less than half a dozen donors actually had questions about the policies. Um, we had a, roughly around a dozen grant recommendations which were flagged, although in this last year we've had more um, that were flagged as well. So I would say overall in the last three years, probably less than 20 grant recommendations were flagged. Um, we have had more than half a dozen meetings take place with fund holders and staff, and it depended on the level um, and the grant recommendation. So there have been times when the committee would inform the CEO and ask the CEO to come in and talk with um, a fund holder. And so our approach, again, has always been to educate the donor and establish shared values. Um, and we also talked with fund holders about grant recommendations that did not violate our policies. So for example, if there was one that did, we specifically pointed to the policy about what it was um, about this uh, nonprofit that um, went against the policy, and then we would provide alternatives. Um, and then we also tried to see if the donor would be willing to change their grant to something that did not undermine our mission. And um, we also informed them that in case there were any grant recommendations that again fell in the gray area that did not cross our policy, currently we let them know that in the future this grant recommendation could be flagged um, should our policy be updated. And um, I would say probably in the whole, again, less than half a dozen grant recommendations were, were declined after, after all was kind of said and done. Um, 
And so this year we're starting to implement our inactive fund policy and communication is really key both internally and externally. Um, and so we've also answered um, questions from other community foundations about our policies and experiences. And if anyone has any questions, you know, they're feel, feel free to reach out to me. I'm always happy to help answer questions and kind of point them, um, you know, to resources like, for example, like the toolkit <laughs> and or any other foundations that I've spoken with who, who are happy to also be a resource. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that and for that generous offer. That's wonderful. Um, so the resources in this section of the toolkit include links to several different community foundations announcements and explanations of why they're enacting an anti-hate policy. And you can use those for inspiration um, and models for your own. So May was the perfect segue into implementing your policy. And I think that sets the stage for us perfectly. Um, the last section of the toolkit is implementing your policy and it starts on page 16. Um, we suggest including your policy and procedure along with other existing policy documents um, that you have and making sure that when you're orienting new staff members and board members that they're aware that you have this policy in place um, so that there is a shared knowledge of it and it doesn't just sort of fall to the wayside. Um, this section also explores what to do when concerns arise and um, and May got us kind of started on that, which is great. And it, what the steps are to resolving a concern um, when an organization or specific donation has been identified as a potential problem. Um, and we're gonna talk even a little bit more about this. I know this is a question that somebody put into the chat as well, um, the Q&A for us as well. So hopefully you're gonna get what you need from this. Um, Jason Weiner, we're back to you. Um, uh, what steps does the, the Cleveland Foundation take to make sure board and staff are aware of the policy and have you needed to implement it? And how's, how has that gone? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so, you know, in addition to, you know, what you mentioned about the way that we're communicating about all our policies um, with, with staff and board, uh, it's really only, it's been a short period of time since the board approved the policy, just, uh, you know, not even two years. So uh, our, our board member is absolutely uh, aware of the policy. Uh, we communicate about it at, um, uh, staff meetings. We have communicated about it at our full staff meetings before. Um, we also uh, list the policy on our webpage. Uh, and our anti hate group policy task force that I'm a part of is a, a collaborative effort. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier, between our advancement and our program and our grants management team uh, and our marketing team. Uh, so um, we're always tapping into the expertise of. Uh, internal colleagues at the foundation to uh, to implement uh, our policy or to uh, have a uh, conversation about you know how we might implement it um, should a red flag um, should a red a red flag come our way um, and to understand better the work of you know of those organizations in the community um, touched on in the in the last section but I think a big part for us of implementation really is about um, you know, that work of making our donors aware of the policy, and that's probably been the most robust um, effort that we've undertaken. Our CEO and our senior leadership stands ready to uh, communicate with any, uh, any donors uh, who may have um, a question about our um, anti-hate group uh, policy. Uh, we've communicated the policy through our uh, private donor portal that all of our fund holders have access to in all of our onboarding materials, the one-on-one -on -one conversations that we have um, with uh, donors who are opening up new funds with us or in our regular uh, annual or regular communication that we have with our fund holders, uh, as well as printed out in those onboarding materials so that, and that we review with uh, our new fund holders. Uh, and then it's also been communicated in talking points, uh, our uh, donor engagement events. So we have a donor education program that uh, extends throughout the year. And we have taken advantage of the audience uh, that uh, uh, participates in, uh, in our education events to talk about our, 
uh, anti-hate group policy. So a lot of a lot of touch points uh, throughout the year for our board, for our staff, uh, and for our donors in uh, implementing this policy. And we really have not had uh, a known incident in this regard. Uh, we've had the policy, like I said, for two years. We have done a look back, and we have there have we have found uh, one organization uh, that uh, we know. Um, we would not make a grant to uh, in the future and in a previous um, uh, distribution or a grant from a, a donor uh, several years ago. Uh, when we've done that, we're flagging those organizations so uh, we don't gift to them in the future through a donor advised fund. Um, and uh, we have also had situations where we would speak with donors about potentially opening up funds as one uh, case that's coming to mind where a donor was very upfront about the organizations that they wanted to support. And, uh, you know, I think there's um, some key words that come up in the names of organizations. Uh, so we, uh, when we're not familiar with um, the name of an organization, and we are with many just given how old we are and how uh, the depth of experience on our team. Uh, and when we, uh, an organization um, comes across um, our grant management desk or across our, our desk as philanthropic advisors that we've not heard of, uh, we often will just do a quick look to see uh, if there's any potential violation of the policy. Uh, there's a situation where we, we did see one that would violate the policy and we let uh, the donor know that this was an organization that we would not be uh, willing to uh, support through our policy. Uh, and, um, you know, that was a, an easy, uh, easy communication. And that is actually sort of an, a real time in process uh, conversation that's happening right now. So there's no report on whether or not they uh, made a decision to um, work with another uh, sponsoring organization or if they will be um, part of the Cleveland Foundation family um, in the future. But overall, I would say overwhelmingly, um, donors and our board members and our staff um, have um, been very supportive of, uh, of the policy. Um, in fact, having conversations with donors one-on-one, -on -one, a lot of times you see a light bulb go off and a smile come to their face that they know that they have a trusted partner in, um, in uh, vetting organizations and knowing that they would not inadvertently uh, wind up supporting an organization that doesn't align with their own values. Thank you so much, Jason, for sharing that. That's I think, you know, what you're what you're talking about is very consistent with what I've heard from other foundations and um, that experience. So I'm sure that is helpful to people to hear. Um, the resources in this section on implementation include. Um, on page 17, a sample letter shared by a community foundation that um, they send to a DAF donor if a request they've made has been flagged, as well as on page 18, a letter that they send uh, informing the donor of their decision. In most cases, they'll be having conversations with donors as well, um, and, and you will too. I think, you know, I think one of the themes that you've heard from um, everyone here is the need for communication, um, which takes some time, but also really builds your relationships with people. Um, and so uh, you want to have those conversations, but putting it in writing is important um, and to document what your decision is and what the problems are, and it helps everyone involved. So that's it. This concludes our overview of the Values Aligned Philanthropy for Community Foundations Toolkit. And now we have time to answer your questions. So I'll turn this back over to Nidal. Hello again, and thank you all. It's been so great to hear from all of you how you, how you went about developing your policies. Um, feel free to put questions in the chat for our audience or put them in the Q&A function you see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we already have some great questions that came in, so I'm going to ask them. I will choose someone from our panel to answer them, but everyone on the panel should feel free to chime in if you have something to add. Um, so I'm going to start with this question. How do you recommend community foundations engaging in areas that are more conservative approach this process. And Roe, you've talked to foundations across the country. Uh, maybe you can share some of the insights that you gained. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do that. And I don't know if other people would want to chime in as well, but I'll say this, um, you know, and, and the toolkit really talks about this. And you'll see in the examples that we provide, we went out of our way to provide you with examples um, and samples from, uh, from conservative as well as more progressive foundations um, or people, or foundations in areas of the country where people are more conservative leaning. I, I will say it, it's everything that you do, it comes down to, you know, your foundation and your values. And that includes how you define things. So for instance, um, defining hate and extremism and taking a position, there are foundations that have emphasized their commitment to freedom of speech. Um, uh, you know, but how, but also talking about um, how extremism is something that frightens them and uh, is goes against their values, and um, and then it, it's all the way toward um, thinking about you know what do you define as hate? I think a lot of people are afraid of hot button issues like reproductive choice or um, LGBTQ issues. And those are issues that your organization needs to figure out, um, you know, where you stand. And then you can pick not only the wording of your policy, but the type of policy that you have. You know, some organizations will just do a due diligence policy where they include some language that's very basic and they don't make a big deal out of it. And it's not part of a bigger kind of cultural or um, deeply like taking a bigger position that their foundation has done. It's they keep it narrow, but they also say, we wanna draw a line. We think we can all agree on some organizations being problematic and that's what they focus on. Yeah, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Any of our other panelists, anything to add? Um, I'm happy to add here because I, I think it's a really great question in terms of like, you know, when it's challenging and in terms of pushback. Um, <clears throat> and I guess the, the only thing that I would could share here is um, when you are in a conversation with someone about maybe um, an organization that your foundation does not want to fund um, because it's very restrictive, um, we have had conversations where we basically talk about how an organization, for example, is not inclusive in its practice. So, and um, in doing so, we, then we appeal to the value of the fund holder for you know, their, their desire to be serving to everyone in the community. And it really depends on each instance, um, but, but it is a difficult one to um, answer. And there, there was one um, where we did um, reject a, a, a grant recommendation for a second year in a, in a row um, to the same organization. And I, I like to think that the fund holder, because that person's older might have forgotten that, that was re rejected the year before, or maybe they were testing us to see, I don't know. But I wish I had been in on that conversation as I was a year earlier, because I had, I had an example, which a colleague pointed out was really powerful. This was an organization that provided domestic violence, um, charitable services, but it required the women who attended to um, sit in on Bible study. So proselytizing, which for us, for our policy goes against it. And I, it was funny because the second year when I thought about that, I thought, had I been on that phone call, I could have talked about how, for me personally growing up, I did experience domestic violence at home. And my mother, if she had gone to this place for services, would not have been included because, or would not have been given services because she wasn't interested in Bible study. Um, and I, I wonder how that fund holder would have reacted hearing you know, personal lived experience from me in that conversation, how like that could have changed their mind. Um, so, so that's where I say it really depends on what the situation is. Um, and the more lived experiences you can share with people, I think it becomes much more real to them. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, along those same lines, we did get a lot of questions about the response from DAF holders. And I think 
I think there's kind of two parts here. And one is how do you respond if a DAF holder disagrees with your new anti-hate policies? Like under what circumstances do you let them just leave? Um, and then how do you ensure that on the front end, donors understand these policies before they open a DAF, before they make a gift? And um, May and Jason, you talked about this a little bit, but Sarah, I'm wondering if you have anything to add. Yeah, we, um, as I said, we have these, uh, our anti-hate um, policy and our racial justice focus very front and center on all of our materials. So, and we're a very young program, right? So we have the advantage of, of you know, being uh, able to be a little more nimble um, with these things. Um, so we haven't had a situation where we have had a donor advisor, you know, uh, object to um, to the policy and um, and want to like you know take their fund out. Um, yeah, it hasn't come up for us. Um, we've been, I guess, fortunate in that way. Um, so yeah, it hasn't. We haven't been pushed on this. Uh, as I said, like because we have a young program, because we've been very out there about our, you know, social and racial justice focus. I think we um, we largely had a group of folks who were that was the kind of um, community foundation they wanted to have their fund with. So, but it's interesting. To, I'm very interested to hear, you know, as we grow, right? And and um, it's very it's great to hear from from uh, the others to understand how like we're probably going to be having to put more things in place to address things as they come up. Um, I'll be happy to jump in here um, and add that for us at EBCF, we did have one instance where a fund holder put some money into the fund <laughs> and then made a grant recommendation. And then lo and behold, we told this fund holder that the grant recommendation could not be made. And so in this one instance, we had to walk back that donation. Um, and, but we of course cleared it with our legal firm first for advice on it. Um, so far, it's only been one example of that. We have had other fund holders who, they'll, they will push us, right? They will push us and, um, and at the same time, they're still around. Um, and so they're kind of watching to see what we do. They're kind of watching to see how firm we are. Um, and I think what we like to do, what we like to think as well is in having these conversations with our fund holders, we're hoping that we're opening their minds a little bit um, as well for further consideration um, with their values and their grant making. Um, you know, we have had very few that have left, um, that happens. Um, but more so, um, we also have had feedback that they love the fact that we are very upfront with our values and, and our policy. So I, I honestly feel that with more time as it goes on, we will get more and more of those donors. So I'm going to go on mute because there's thunder happening here. You know, I'd also just like to chime in that, yeah, I've also heard a number of stories of donors who were really happy to be alerted about this I, because a lot of people assume that the IRS screens out hate groups and they assume that if an organization is a nonprofit, that there's no way they could be engaging in hate related activity. But you would think that would be true, but the IRS doesn't have the capacity to do the kind of monitoring it would require. So, you know, there it is actually a really, it can be really, really positive. And I've heard stories of a number of donors that have said, oh my gosh, I had no idea. If I had known that's what they were doing and that's what they stood for, um, I wouldn't have wanted to give to them. I, you know, also I'd say that I've heard stories of really great conversations where a foundation has said, look, if it's this issue that you care about, here are some alternatives. Here are some other places you might think about directing your funds and that donors mostly have been really happy with that, or they've decided, well, for this one particular thing, I'm going to give directly because I don't agree with you. I'm going to give directly to them um, and not do it through my DAF. And that's been fine too. So we are at time. I want to thank everybody for joining us this afternoon, at least afternoon for those of us on the East Coast. 
Thank you especially to Roe, Jason, May, and Sarah for taking the time to talk us through how your organizations did this. Um, we are working on additional learning opportunities, peer connection opportunities in this area, so keep an eye on your inbox. You'll be hearing from me soon. Uh, this webinar will be posted online as part of our Values Aligned Philanthropy resources. And if you have additional questions or a resource to, to share, please email govt at cof.org. We will try to get to any questions that you've sent us already uh, via email afterwards. And yeah, thank you all for attending. Have a great rest of your days.